Hello wonderful people, it's Medicosis Perfect Genetis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my cardiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about heart murmurs. We talked about the types of shock, such as hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, neurogenic shock, and distributive shock. We also talked about the autonomic nervous system and its effect on the heart. We also talked about cardiac arrhythmias. Today, we have a disease that is an autonomic disorder where the symptoms are related to posture, especially when I stand up, orthostasis. The word ortho means straight upright. Tachycardia meaning fast heart rate. And syndrome means synchrony of symptoms that cluster together. So in these patients change from a recumbent position to an upright standing position, there is usually tachycardia or racing heart beats. How can we diagnose it? How can we treat it? Let's find out. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. This is my physiology playlist. Please watch these videos in order. There is another playlist for cardiology. So what is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS for short? It's an autonomic disorder or autonomic dysregulation. Remember that your nervous system is made of somatic portion and autonomic portion. The somatic is voluntary, under your control. But the autonomic is involuntary, auto from autonomous, from automatic. It works without your input. Unfortunately, if you ask the average student or doctor what's the autonomic nervous system made of, they will say sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, and that's it. But there is a third branch, which is the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system in the gastrointestinal system in my guts is an autonomic system. These patients have chronic symptoms for more than three to six months. If the symptoms started yesterday, we cannot diagnose POTS yet. Standing up from a recumbent position causes tachycardia or increased heart rate by how much? By more than 30 beats per minute. So for example, suppose that my heart rate lying down was 60 beats per minute. For this to be POTS, when I stand up, the heart rate should increase by more than 30. So 60 plus 30 is 90, which means my heart rate should be greater than 90 if I have POTS. However, this POTS is not the same as orthostatic hypotension. What's the difference? In orthostatic hypotension, if I stand up, it's not just tachycardia, but tachycardia and hypotension. However, in patients with POTS, we have tachycardia upon standing up, but without hypotension or without significant hypotension, I should say. If I stand up, the symptoms get worse. But if I lie flat in the recumbent position again, the symptoms tend to improve. Volume depletion and dehydration tend to make the symptoms worse. What is the difference between volume depletion and dehydration? Volume depletion is basically loss of salt and water from the body. But dehydration just means no hydro, loss of water alone. So volume depletion is loss of salt and water, but dehydration is loss of water only. Why should I care? Because if the patient is dehydrated, no water, we give the patient water only, and that's it. But if the patient is volume depleted, we need to give the patient salt and water. Pots tend to be more common in females than males. The ratio is about 5 to 1. If you have watched my neuroanatomy playlist, you would recall that the nervous system is divided into somatic and autonomic. Somatic is voluntary, under your volitional control. But autonomic is involuntary, which means it's not under your control. The word autonomic is synonymous with the word visceral, which is synonymous with the word splanchnic. One of the autonomic or visceral reflexes is the baroreceptor reflex. What does the word barrow mean? It means pressure. Does anyone remember the barometer, which is a device to measure pressure? Receptor is a receptor and reflex because it happens reflexively. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, please drop a heart emoji in the comments. To understand how the barrow receptor works, we need to review some anatomy. This is the heart. The heart has four chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The left ventricle has oxygenated blood. If you follow the left ventricle, the left ventricle is going to eject or pump its blood to the aorta. The aorta is made of many parts. This is the ascending aorta, this is the aortic arch, and then the descending thoracic aorta. In the aortic arch, we have three famous branches. Brachiocephalic artery, left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. 
In this aortic arch, we have baroreceptors. The baroreceptors of the aortic arch are controlled by the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve. Here is the aortic arch. This is the first branch, which is the brachiocephalic artery. The brachiocephalic artery will then subdivide into right common carotid and right subclavian. Then the common carotid will divide into external carotid artery and internal carotid artery. At this bifurcation point, there is a wide dilated area called the carotid sinus. It too contains baroreceptors. If you wish to download these doozy colorful notes, go to metagosisperfectionatus.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you want me to personally tutor you, reach out to me on my website. So we find baroreceptors in the aortic arch, and these are controlled by the vagus nerve. We also have baroreceptors in the carotid sinus, but these are controlled by the glossopharyngeal nerve or the ninth cranial nerve. So how does this baroreceptor reflex work? First of all, these baroreceptors are stretch receptors and we find them in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. Let's say, for example, that my extracellular fluid volume decreased because I have hypovolemia. This will tend to lower my blood pressure. As my blood pressure decreases, and of course you know that pressure equals force over area, so when I say that the pressure decreased, think of it as the force decreasing. So therefore, the force by which we press on and stretch those bare receptors is going to decline. And the brain will feel that for sure. When the brain feels hypotension, it will respond by trying to raise the blood pressure back to normal. How does the brain do this? By sending sympathetic nervous system fibers into the heart. These sympathetic fibers release norepinephrine and dopamine, and this will stimulate the beta-1 receptors in the heart, leading to increased heart rate, increased cardiac contractility, and alpha-1 receptors on vessels, leading to vasoconstriction of vessels, whether they are arterioles or veins. The end result is that we bring the blood pressure up and back to normal. However, what if we have the opposite? What if I have hypervolemia and hypertension? The blood pressure is high. Then there will be more stretch of these bare receptors. They will be stretched more and the brain for sure will feel this. And the brain in response to the hypertension will try to decrease the blood pressure and back to normal. How does this happen? The brain will send vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, not the sympathetic. The vagus will release acetylcholine, which will tend to decrease heart rate, decrease cardiac contractility, and will not constrict the vessels. Add all of these factors together, and the blood pressure tends to decrease back to normal. This is one such example of an autonomic reflex. It's a visceral reflex. Unfortunately, in patients with POTS, the autonomic nervous system tends to be dysregulated. Demographics, risk factors, and precipitating factors for POTS. It's more common in females than males. The ratio is about 5 to 1. If I have family history of POTS, it makes me more likely to develop POTS than the general population. Previous viral infection or systemic illness, such as advanced diabetes, because advanced diabetes can cause autonomic neuropathy, which causes dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. Joint hypermobility syndrome, such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, are associated with POTS. If you want to learn more about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, please refer to my biochemistry playlist. Hypovolemia or extracellular fluid volume depletion can lead to POTS. This is a patient who lost water and salt. Trauma, dehydration, sepsis are risk factors. Dehydration is a risk factor. Autoimmune diseases are risk factors, such as multiple sclerosis. If you want to learn more about MS, refer to my neurology playlist. Mitral valve prolapse is also associated with POTS. About 40% of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome have POTS. Chronic fatigue syndrome has many names, this is just one of them. Etiological types of POTS include hypovolemic POTS, neuropathic POTS, hyperadrenergic POTS, where I have lots of catecholamines such as noradrenaline, adrenaline, dopamine. And that's why we say hyperadrenergic. Adrenergic, adrenaline. Deconditioned POTS and immune-related POTS. 
Clinical picture of POTS, symptoms and signs. What's the difference? Symptoms has a Y, so you, the patient, will tell me what's up. Signs has an I, so I, as a doctor or a nurse, will discover something by physical examination. Symptoms include the patient complains of palpitations, which means racing heart beats, especially when the patient is standing up like this. Dizziness and lightheadedness, especially when standing up. Blurry vision, chronic fatigue, daytime sleepiness. Exercise intolerance, feeling cold all the time and having heat intolerance, nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain can happen. And in some cases there is even presyncope or syncope. To learn more about syncope, please refer to my emergency medicine playlist. Signs include tachycardia of more than 30 beats per minute upon standing up, increased pulse pressure. Marked variability from one beat of the heart to the next beat. Variability in what? Variability in heart rate and pulse pressure. What is pulse pressure? It's the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. If my systolic blood pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury and my diastolic blood pressure is 80 millimeters of mercury, then the pulse pressure is 120 minus 80 equals 40 millimeters of mercury. Sometimes patients have positive flak sign. What is this? It is difficulty palpating the radial pulse in the patient's wrist when the patient is standing up for a long period of time. Some patients have acrocyanosis. What does the word acro mean? Acro means extremities or limbs. Cyanosis means what? Osis means condition, as in medicosis perfectionalis, which means a condition of perfect medicine. Cyan means blue. So this is a condition of bluish discoloration of the extremities, usually the hands and the feet. And this happens with prolonged standing. How can we diagnose postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome? Clinically, by signs and symptoms. Next, the table tilt test. What does that mean? You tilt the table. So first, you start with the patient supine or recumbent like this. And then, while the patient is lying on the examination table, you tilt the table like this. And then you're going to measure the patient's blood pressure, heart rate, pulse pressure, etc. Upon tilting the table like this, and the patient is now is in the standing position, heart rate tends to go up, rising more than 30 beats per minute. There is no drop in the blood pressure, or it's very minimal, unlike orthostatic hypotension. Some patients have increased catecholamines when they stand up, and you can actually measure this when the patient is supine and measure it again when the patient is upright. Increased catecholamine can happen in the hyperadrenergic subtype of POTS. Increased pulse pressure upon standing up and positive flag sign upon standing up. We can do an ECG, we can do a halter monitor, which is basically ECG for 24 hours. Complete blood count with iron studies to rule out anemia because anemia can cause similar symptoms, but usually not identical. Thyroid panel, especially TSH level, to rule out hypothyroidism, because hypothyroidism can have similar symptoms. Measure the catecholamines in the plasma and in the urine. What are the catecholamines? We have epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. They will be elevated in POTS, especially the hyperadrenergic type. How can we manage POTS? So far, there is no magical cure. We try to manage the symptoms. First, you start with non-pharmacological therapy before you do any pharmacological or surgical slash intervention. Avoid the aggravating factors. If some medications make the symptoms worse, try to stop them. If alcohol makes the symptoms worse, stop it. Excessive caffeine makes the symptoms worse, stop it. Dehydration makes the symptoms worse, drink water. Extreme heat causes spots, avoid it. Then drink a lot of water. And if this is not enough, add sodium, whether by eating some salty food or sodium tablets. Next, some patients benefit from wearing abdominal binders or supporting hose to decrease the venous congestion in the lower extremities. Exercise is very, very, very important to patients with POTS, especially aerobic exercise with lower extremity strengthening. And that's why we're using supporting hose. It's the same idea. And because the patient has the symptoms while standing up, we start the exercises while supine, such as rowing exercises, recumbent cycling, so that the patient can exercise without standing up for a long period of time. If there is syncope, which means the patient literally faints or loses consciousness, now this is severe. Some of these patients might improve by atrioventricular nodal ablation, and or pacemaker placement. 
Pharmacological therapy, normal saline, what's that? It is basically salt and water, especially if the symptoms are severe and or acute. Fluid cortisone, what is this? It's a mineralocorticoid agonist. What is a mineralocorticoid? It's like aldosterone. Why do you call it mineralo? Because it deals with minerals. So aldosterone or fluid cortisone tends to increase sodium and water in the body by preventing their excretion. Beta blockers can help, why? Because beta blockers block the beta receptors especially the beta-1 receptor. And when I block the beta-1 receptor, I tend to decrease the tachycardia, which is the T in POTS. Ivabradine can help. If you want to learn more about Ivabradine, check out my pharmacology playlist, which will teach you about all of these medications as well. Clonidine and alpha-methyldopa. If you know the mechanism of clonidine and alpha-methyldopa, comment below. Medodrine, why? Because it's a vasoconstrictor. It is similar to strengthening the muscles of the lower extremity or wearing a supporting hose. You're trying to constrict to prevent stasis and stagnation and congestion of veins in the lower extremities. Moreover, if you vasoconstrict, the brain will feel this as hypertension and will respond by sending the vagus nerve to lower the heart rate. Oh, and I want to lower the heart rate because I have tachycardia. Pyridostigmine, which is an acetylcholine stress inhibitor. When you inhibit the destroyer of acetylcholine, acetylcholine will go up. Acetylcholine is cholinergic, just like the vagus, and acetylcholine tends to decrease heart rate, which is needed because I have tachycardia. Many patients have debilitating disease, so psychological support is important. My favorite part of the lecture. What is the mechanism of action of midodrine? Please let me know your answer in the comments. To learn more about the cholinergics and the anticholinergics, the adrenergics and the anti-adrenergics, the sympathomimetics, sympatholytics, parasympathomimetics, and lytics, download my autonomic pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It comes with videos, notes, and cases. If you want to learn about cardiac arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, strokes, ARDS, acute limb ischemia, drowning, lots of toxidromes, and more, download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It comes with videos, notes, and cases. Help me make more videos by supporting my channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 600 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine, chemistry, math, and physics make perfect sense.